Hi, it's Miss Lisa from the St. Paris Public Library. Welcome back to our last night of reading Charlotte's Web in our program, Just Before Bed, Chapter 19. The Egg Sack. Next morning, when the first light came into the sky and the sparrows stirred in the trees, when the cows rattled, their chains and roosters crowed, and early automobiles went whispering along the road, Wilbur awoke and looked for Charlotte. He saw her up overhead in a corner near the back of his pen. She was very quiet. Her eight legs were spread wide. She seemed to have shrunk during the night. Next to her, attached to the ceiling, Wilbur saw a curious object. It was a sort of sack or cocoon. It was peach-colored and looked as though it were made of cotton candy. Are you awake, Charlotte? he said softly. Yes, came the answer. What is that nifty little thing? Did you make it? I did indeed, replied Charlotte in a weak voice. Is it a plaything? Plaything? I should say not. It is my egg sack. My magnum opus. I don't know what a magnum opus is, said Wilbur. That's Latin, explained Charlotte. It means great work. This egg sack is my great work, the finest thing I have ever made. What's inside it, asked Wilbur. Eggs? Five hundred and fourteen of them, she replied. Five hundred and fourteen, said Wilbur. You're kidding. No, I'm not. I counted them. I started counting, so I kept on just to keep my mind occupied. It's a perfectly beautiful egg sack, said Wilbur, feeling as happy as though he had constructed it himself. Yes, it is pretty, replied Charlotte, patting the sack with her two front legs. Anyway, I can guarantee that it is strong. It's made out of the toughest material I have. It is also waterproof. The eggs are inside and will be warm and dry. Charlotte, said Wilbur dreamily, are you really going to have 514 children? If nothing happens, yes, she said. Of course, they won't show up till next spring. Wilbur noticed that Charlotte's voice sounded sad. What makes you sound so downhearted? I should think you'd be terribly happy about this. Oh, don't pay any attention to me, said Charlotte. I just don't have much pep anymore. I guess I feel sad because I won't ever see my children. What do you mean you won't see your children? Of course you will. We'll all see them. It's going to be simply wonderful next spring in the barn. Cellar with 514 baby spiders running around all over the place. The geese will have to have a new set of goslings and the sheep will have their new lambs. Maybe, said Charlotte quietly. However, I have a feeling I'm not going to see the results of last night's efforts. I don't feel good at all. I think I'm languishing, to tell you the truth. Wilbur didn't understand the word languish and to bother Charlotte to ask her to explain, but he was so worried he felt he had to ask. What does languishing mean? It means I'm slowing up, feeling my age. I'm not young anymore, Wilbur, but I don't want you to worry about me. This is your big day today. Look at my web. Doesn't it show up well with the dew on it? Charlotte's web never looked more beautiful than it looked this morning. Each strand held dozens of bright drops of early morning dew. The lights from the east struck it and made it look made it all plain and clear. It was a perfect piece of design and building. In another hour or two, a steady stream of people would pass by, admiring it and reading it, and looking at Wilbur, Wilbur and marveling at the miracle. As Wilbur was studying the web, a pair of whiskers and a sharp face appeared. Slowly, Templeton dragged himself across the pen and threw himself down in the corner. I'm back, he said in a husky voice. What a night! The rat was swollen to twice his normal size. His stomach was as big around as a jelly jar. What a night, he repeated hoarsely. What feasting and carousing, a real gorge. I must have eaten the remains of 30 lunches. Never have I 
ever seen such leavings and everything well ripened and seasoned with the passage of time and the heat of the day. Oh, it was rich, my friends, rich. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Charlotte in disgust. It would serve you right if you had an acute attack of indigestion. Don't worry about my stomach, snarled Templeton. I, it can handle anything. And by the way, I've got some bad news. As I came past that pig next door, the one that's called Uncle, I noticed a blue tag on the front of his pen. That means he has won first prize. I guess you're licked, Wilbur. You might as well relax. Nobody's going to hang around any metal on you. Furthermore, I wouldn't be surprised if Zuckerman changes his mind about you. Wait till he gets hankering for some pork, fresh pork or smoked ham and crisp bacon. He'll take the knife to you, my boy. Be still, Templeton, said Charlotte. You are too stuffed and bloated to know what you're saying. Don't pay any attention to him, Wilbur. Wilbur tried not to think about what the rat had just said. He decided to change the sub subject. Templeton, said Wilbur, if you weren't so dopey, you would have noticed that Charlotte has made an egg sack. She's going to become a mother. For your information, there are 514 eggs in that peachy little sack. Is this true? asked the rat, eyeing the sack suspiciously. Yes, it's true, sighed Charlotte. Congratulations, mur murmured Templeton. This has been a night. He closed his eyes, pulled some straw over himself, and dropped off into a deep sleep. Wilbur and Charlotte were glad to be rid of him for a while. At nine o'clock, Mr. Arable's truck rolled into the fairgrounds and came to a stop at Wilbur's pen. Everybody climbed out. Look, cried Fern, Fern look at Charlotte's web. Look what it says. The grown-ups and children joined hands and stood there studying the new sign. Humble, said Mr. Zuckerman. Now isn't that just the word for Wilbur? Everyone rejoiced to find the miracle of the web had been repeated. Wilbur gazed up lovingly into their faces. He looked very humble and very grateful. Fern winked at Charlotte. Lurvy soon got busy. He poured a bucket of warm slop into the trough. And while Wilbur ate his breakfast, Lurvy scratched him gently with his smooth stick. Wait a minute, cried Avery. Look at this. He pointed to the blue tag on Uncle's pen. This pig has won first prize already. The Zuckermans and the Arables stared at the tag. Mrs. Zuckerman began to cry. Nobody said a word. They just stared at the tag. Then they stared at Uncle. Then they stared at the tag again. Lurvy took out an enormous handkerchief and blew his nose very loud, so loud, in fact, that the noise was heard by stable boys over at the horse barn. Can I have some money, asked Fern. I want to go out in the midway. You stay right where you are, said her mother. Tears came to Fern's eyes. What's everybody crying about, asked Mr. Zuckerman. Let's get busy. Edith, bring the buttermilk. Sounds like he's going to get another buttermilk bath. Mrs. Zuckerman wiped her eyes with her handkerchief. She went to the truck and came back with a gallon jar of buttermilk. Bath time, said Zuckerman cheerfully. He and Mrs. Zuckerman and Avery climbed into Wilbur's pen. Avery slowly poured the buttermilk on Wilbur's head and back, and as it trickled down his sides and cheeks, Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman rubbed it into his hair and skin. Passerby stopped to watch. Pretty soon, quite a crowd had gathered. Wilbur grew beautifully white and smooth. The morning sun shone through his pink ears. He isn't as big as that pig next door, remarked one bystander, but he's cleaner. That's what I like. So do I, said another man. He's humble, too, said the woman, reading the sign on the web. Everybody who visited the pig pen had a good word to say about Wilbur. Everyone admired the web, and of course nobody noticed Charlotte. Suddenly, a voice was heard on the loudspeaker. Attention, please, it said. Will Mr. Homer Zuckerman bring his famous pig to the judge's booth in front of the grandstand? A special award will be made there in 20 minutes. Everyone is invited to attend. Crate your pig, please, Mr. Zuckerman, and report to the judge's booth promptly. For a moment after this announcement, the Arables and the Zuckermans were able to speak and move, were not, were unable to speak or move. Then Avery picked up a handful of straw and threw it high into the air and gave a loud yell. 
The straw fluttered down like confetti into Fern's hair. Mr. Zuckerman hugged Mrs. Zuckerman. Mr. Arable kissed Mrs. Arable. Avery kissed Wilbur. Lurby took, shook hands with everybody. Fern hugged her mother. Avery hugged Fern. Mrs. Arable hugged Mr. Zuckerman. Mrs. Zuckerman. Up overhead in the shadows of the ceiling, Charlotte crouched unseen, her front legs encircling her egg sack. Her heart was not beating as strongly as usual, and she felt weary and old, but she was sure at last that she had saved Wilbur's life, and she felt peaceful and contented. We have no time to lose, shouted Mr. Zuckerman. Lurvy, help with the crate. Can I have some money, asked Fern. You wait, said Mrs. Arable. Can't you see everybody is busy? Put that empty buttermilk jar in the truck, commanded Mr. Arable. Avery grabbed the jar and rushed to the truck. Does my hair look all right, asked Mrs. Zuckerman. Looks fine, snapped Mr. Zuckerman as he, as he and Lurvy set the crate down in front of Wilbur. You didn't even look at my hair, said Mrs. Zuckerman. You're all right, Edith, said Mrs. Arable. Just keep calm. Templeton, asleep in the straw, heard the commotion and awoke. He didn't know exactly what was going on, but when he saw the men shoving Wilbur into the crate, he made up his mind to go along. He watched his chance, and then want, no one was looking. He crept into the crate and buried himself in the straw at the bottom. All ready, boys, cried Mr. Zuckerman. Let's go. He and Mr. Arable and Lurvy and Avery grabbed the crate and boosted it over the side of the pen and up into the truck. Fern jumped aboard and sat on top of the crate. She still had straw in her hair and looked very pretty and excited. Mr. Arable started the motor. Everyone climbed in, and off they drove to the judge's booth in front of the grandstand. As they passed the Ferris wheel, Fern gazed up at it and wished she were in the topmost car with Henry Fussy at her side. Chapter 20. The Hour of Triumph. Special announcement, said the loudspeaker in a pompous voice. The management of the fair takes great pleasure in presenting Mr. Homer L. Zuckerman and his famous pig. The truck bearing the extraordinary animal is now approaching the infield. Kindly stand back and give the truck room to proceed. In a few moments, the pig will be unloaded in the special judging ring in front of the grandstand where a special award will be made. Will the crowd please make way and let the truck pass? Thank you. Wilbur trembled when he heard this speech. He felt happy but dizzy. The truck crept along slowly and at low speed. Crowds of people surrounded it, and Mr. Arable had to drive very carefully in order not to run over anybody. At last, he managed to reach the judge's stand. Avery jumped out and lowered the tailgate. I'm scared to death, whispered Mrs. Zuckerman. Hundreds of people are looking at us. Cheer up, replied Mrs. Arable. This is fun. Unload your pig, please, said the loudspeaker. All together now, boys, said Mr. Zuckerman. Several men stepped forward from the crowd to help lift the crate. Avery was the busiest helper of all. Tuck your shirt in, Avery, cried Mrs. Zuckerman, and tighten your belt. Your pants are coming down. Can't you see I'm busy, replied Avery in disgust. Look, cried Fern, pointing. There's Henry. Don't shout, Fern, said her mother, and don't point. Can I please have some money, asked Fern. Henry invited me to go on the Ferris wheel again, only I don't think he has any money left. He ran out of money. Mrs. Arable opened her handbag. Here, she said. Here is 40 cents. Now don't get lost and be back at our regular meeting place by the pigeon pig pen very soon. Fern raced off, ducking and dodging through the crowd in search of Henry. The Zuckerman pig is now being taken from the crate, boomed the voice in the loudspeaker. Stand by for an announcement. Templeton crouched under the straw at the bottom of the crate. What a lot of nonsense, he muttered. What a lot of fuss about nothing. Over in the pig pen, silent and alone, Charlotte rested. Her two front legs embraced the egg sack. Charlotte could hear everything that was said on the loudspeaker. The words gave her courage. This was her hour of triumph. As Wilbur came out of the crate, the crowd clapped and cheered. Mr. Zuckerman took off his cap and bowed. Lurvy pulled his big handkerchief from his pocket and wiped the sweat from the back of his neck. Avery knelt in the dirt by Wilbur's side, busily stroking him and showing off. Mrs. Zuckerman and Mr. Er Mrs. Arable stood on the running board of the truck. 
Ladies and gentlemen, said the loudspeaker, we now present Mr. Homer L. Zuckerman's distinguished pig. The fame of this unique animal has spread to the far corners of the earth, attracting many valuable tourists to our great state. Many of you recall that never-to-be-forgotten day last summer when the writing appeared mysteriously on the spider's web in Mr. Zuckerman's barn, calling the attention of all and sundry to the fact that the pig was completely out of the ordinary. This miracle has never been fully explained, although learned men have visited the Zuckerman's pig pen to study and observe the phenomenon. In the last an analysis, we simply know that we are dealing with super supernatural forces here, and we should all feel proud and grateful. In the words of the spider's web, ladies and gentlemen, this is some pig. Wilbur blushed. He stood perfectly still and tried to look his best. This magnificent animal, continued the loudspeaker, is truly terrific. Look at him, ladies and gentlemen. Note the smoothness and whiteness of the coat. Observe the spotless skin, the healthy pink glow of the ears and snout. It's the buttermilk, whispered Mrs. Arable to Mrs. Zuckerman. Note the general radiance of this animal. Then remember the day when the word radiant appeared clearly on the web. Whence came this mysterious writing? Not from the spider. We can rest assured of that. Spiders are very clever at weaving their webs, but needless to say, spiders cannot write. Oh, they can't, can they, murmured Charlotte to herself. Ladies and gentlemen, continued the loudspeaker, I must not ta take any more of your valuable time. On behalf of the governors of the fair, I have the honor of awarding a special prize of $25 to Mr. Zuckerman toward together with a handsome bronze medal suitably engraved in token of our appreciation of the part played by this pig, this radiant, this terrific, this humble pig in attracting so many visitors to our great county fair. Wilbur had been feeling dizzier and dizzier through this long complimentary speech. When he heard the crowd begin to cheer and clap again, he suddenly fainted away. His legs collapsed, his mind went blank, and he fell to the ground unconscious. What's wrong? asked the loudspeaker. What's going on, Zuckerman? What's the trouble with your pig? Avery was kneeling by Wilbur's head, stroking him. Mr. Zuckerman was dancing about, fanning him with his cap. He's all right, cried Mr. Zuckerman. He gets these spells. He's modest and can't stand praise. Well, we can't give a prize to a dead pig, said the loudspeaker. It's never been done. He isn't dead, hollered Zuckerman. He's fainted. He gets embarrassed easily. Run for some water, Lurvy. Lurvy sprang from the judge's ring and disappeared. Templeton poked his head from the straw. He noticed that the end of Wilbur's tail was within reach. Templeton grinned. I'll tend to this, he chuckled. He took Wilbur's tail in his mouth and bit it, just as hard as he could bite. The pain revived Wilbur. In a flash, he was back on his feet. Ouch! He screamed. Hooray! yelled the crowd. He's up. The pig's up. Good work, Zuckerman. That's some pig. Everyone was delight delighted. Mr. Zuckerman was the most pleased of all. He sighed with relief. Nobody had seen Templeton. The rat had done his work well. And now one of the judges climbed into the ring with the prize. He handed Mr. Zuckerman two $10 bills and a $5 bill. Then he tied the medal around Wilbur's neck. Then he shook hands with Mr. Zuckerman while Wilbur blushed. Avery put out his hand and the judge shook his hand, hands with him too. The crowd cheered. A photographer took Wilbur's picture. A great feeling of happiness swept over the Zuckermans and the Arables. This was the greatest moment in Mr. Zuckerman's life. It is deeply satisfying to win a prize in front of a lot of people. As Wilbur was being shoved back into the crate, Lurvy came charging through the crowd carrying a pail of water. His eyes had a wild look. Without hesitating a second, he dashed the water at Wilbur. In his excitement, he missed his aim and the water splashed all over Mr. Zuckerman and Avery. They got soaking wet. For goodness sakes, bellowed Mr. Zuckerman, who was really drenched. What ails you, Lur Lurvy? Can't you see the pig is all right? You asked for water, said Lurvy meekly. 
I didn't ask for a shower bath, said Mr. Zuckerman. The crowd roared with laughter. Finally, Mr. Zuckerman had to laugh, too. And, of course, Avery was tickled to find himself so wet, and he immediately started to act like a clown. He pretended he was taking a shower bath. He made faces and danced around and rumbled imaginary soap under his armpits. Then he dried himself with an imaginary towel. Avery, stop it, cried his mother. Stop showing off. But the crowd loved it. Avery heard nothing but the applause. He liked being the clown in a ring with everybody watching in front of the grandstand. When he discovered there was still a little water left in the bottom of the pail, he raised the pail high in the air and dumped the water on himself and made faces. The children in the grandstand screamed with appreciation. At last, things calmed down. Wilbur was loaded into the truck. Avery was led from the ring by his mother and placed on the seat of the truck to dry off. The truck, driven by Mr. Arable, crawled slowly back to the pig pen. Avery's wet trousers made a big wet spot on the seat. Chapter 21 Last Day Charlotte and Wilbur were alone. The families had gone to look for Fern. Templeton was asleep. Wilbur lay resting after the excitement and strain of the ceremony. His medal still hung from his neck. By looking out of the corner of his eye, he could see it. Charlotte, said Wilbur after a while, why are you so quiet? I like to sit still, she said. I've always been rather quiet. Yes, but you seem especially so today. Do you feel all right? A little tired, perhaps, but I feel peaceful. Your success in the ring this morning was, to a small degree, my success. Your future is assured. You will live secure and safe, Wilbur. Nothing can harm you now. These autumn days will shorten and grow cold. The leaves will shake loose from the trees and fall. Christmas will come and then the snows of winter. You will live and to enjoy the beauty of the frozen world, for you mean a great deal to Zuckerman, and he will not harm you ever. Winter will pass and days will lengthen. The ice will melt in the pasture pond. The song sparrow will return and sing. The frogs will awaken. The wind will blow again. All these sights and sounds and smells will be in yours to enjoy, Wilbur. This lovely world, these precious days, Charlotte stopped. A moment later, a tear came to Wilbur's eye. Oh, Charlotte, he said, to think that when I first met you, I thought you were cruel and bloodthirsty. When he recovered from his emotion, he spoke again. Why did you do all of this for me, he asked. I don't deserve it. I've never done anything for you. You've been my friend, replied Charlotte. That is in itself is a tremendous thing. I wove my webs for you because I liked you. After all, what's a life anyway? We're born, we live a little while, we die. A spider's life can't help being something of a mess with all its trapping and, eat, and eating flies. By helping you, perhaps I was trying to lift up my life a trifle. Heaven knows anyone's life can stand a little of that. Well, said Wilbur, I'm not good at making speeches. I haven't got your gift for words, but you have saved me, Charlotte, and I would gladly give my life for you. I really would. I'm sure you would, and I thank you for your generous sentiments. Charlotte, said Wilbur, we're all going home today. The fair is almost over. Won't it be wonderful to be back home in the barn cellar again with the sheep and the geese? Aren't you anxious to get home? For a moment, Charlotte said nothing. Then she spoke in a voice so low, Wilbur could hardly hear the words. I will not be going back to the barn, she said. Wilbur leapt to his feet. Not going back, he cried. Charlotte, what are you talking about? I'm done for, she replied. In a day or two, I'll be dead. I haven't even strength enough to climb down into the crate. I doubt if I have enough silk in my spinnerets to lower me to the ground. Hearing this, Wilbur threw himself down in the agony of pain and sorrow. Great sobs racked his body. He heaved and grunted with desolation. Charlotte, he moaned, Charlotte, my true friend. Come now, let's not make a scene, said the spider. Be quiet, Wilbur. Stop thrashing about. 
But I can't stand it, shouted Wilbur. I won't leave you here alone to die. If you're going to stay here, I shall stay too. Don't be ridiculous, said Charlotte. You can't stay here. Suckerman and Lurvy and John Arable and the others will be back any minute now. And they'll shove you into that crate and away you'll go. Besides, it wouldn't make any sense for you to stay. There would be no one to feed you. The fairgrounds will, be, will soon be empty and deserted. Wilbur was in a panic. He raced round and around the pen, suddenly had an idea. He thought of the egg sack and the 514 little spiders that would hatch in the spring. If Charlotte herself was unable to go home to the barn, at least he must take her children along. Wilbur rushed to the front of his pen. He put his front feet up on the top board and gazed around. In the distance, he saw the Arables and the Zuckermans approaching. He knew he would have to act quickly. Where's Templeton, he demanded. He's in that corner under the straw, asleep, said Charlotte. Wilbur rushed over, pushed his strong snout under the rat, and tossed him into the air. Templeton, screamed Wilbur, pay attention. The rat, surprised out of his sound sleep, looked first dazed, then disgusted. What kind of monkey shine is this, he growled. Can't a rat catch a wink of sleep without being rudely popped into the air? Listen to me, said, cried Wilbur. Charlotte is very ill. She only has a short time to live. She cannot accompany us home because of her condition. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary that I take her egg sack with me. I can't reach it and I can't climb. You are the only one that can get it. There's not a second to be lost. The people are coming. They'll be here in no time. Please, 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 Templeton, climb up and get the egg sack. The rat yawned. He straightened his whiskers. Then he looked up at the egg sack. So, he said in disgust, so it's old Templeton to the rescue again, is it? Templeton, do this. Templeton, do that. Templeton, please run down to the dump and get me a magazine clipping. Templeton, please lend me a piece of string so I can spin a web. Oh, hurry up, said Wilbur. Hurry up, Templeton. But the rat was in no hurry. He began in imitating Wilbur's voice. So it's hurry up, Templeton, is it? He said, ho, ho. And what thanks do I ever get for these services? I would like to know. Never a kind word for old Templeton. Only abuse and wisecracks and side remarks. Never a kind word for a rat. Templeton, said Wilbur in desperation. If you don't stop talking and get busy, all will be lost and I will die of a broken heart. Please climb up. Templeton lay back in the straw. Lazily, he placed his forepaws behind his head and crossed his knees in an attitude of complete relaxation. Die of a broken heart, he mimicked. How touching. My, my. I notice that it's always me you come to when in trouble. But I've never heard of anyone's heartbreaking on my account. Oh, no. Who cares anything about old Templeton? Get up, screamed Wilbur. Stop acting like a spoiled child. Templeton grinned and laid still. Who made, who made trip after trip to the dump, he asked. Why, it was old Templeton. Who saved Charlotte's life by scaring that arable boy away with a rotten goose egg? Bless my soul, I believe it was old Templeton. Who bit your tail and got you back on your feet this morning after you had fainted in front of the crowd, old Templeton? Has it ever occurred to you that I'm sick of running errands and doing favors? What do you think I am, anyway, a rat of all work? Wilbur was desperate. The people were coming and the rat was failing him. Suddenly, he remembered Templeton's fondness for food. Templeton, he said, I will make you a solemn promise. Get Charlotte's egg sack for me, and from now on, I will let you eat first when Lurvy slops me. I will let you have your choice of everything in the trough, and I won't touch a thing until you're through. The rat sat up. You mean that, he said. I promise. I cross my heart. All right, it's a deal, said the rat. He walked to the wall and started to climb. His stomach was still swollen from last night's gorge. Groaning and complaining, he pulled himself slowly to the ceiling. He crept along till he reached the egg sack. Charlotte moved aside for him. She was dying, but she still had strength enough to move a little. Then Templeton bared his long, ugly teeth and began snipping the threads that fastened the sack to the ceiling. Wilbur watched from below. 
Use extreme care, he said. I don't want a single one of those eggs harmed. Thif thruff thick my mouth, explained the rat. If worth that, then caramel apple. But Templeton worked away at the job and managed to cut the sack adrift and carry it to the ground, where he dropped it in front of Wilbur. Wilbur, Wilbur heaved a great sigh of relief. Thank you, Templeton, he said. I will never forget this as long as I live. Neither will I, said the rat, picking his teeth. I feel as though I'd eaten a spool of thread. Well, home we go. Templeton crept into the crate and buried himself in the straw. He got out of sight just in time. Lurvy and John Arable and Mr. Zuckerman came along at that moment, followed by Mrs. Arable and Mrs. Zuckerman and Avery and Fern. Wilbur had already decided how he would carry the egg sack. There was only one way possible. He carefully took a li the little bundle in his mouth and held it there on top of his tongue. He remembered that Charlotte had told him that the sack was waterproof and strong. It felt funny on his tongue and made him drool a bit, and of course he couldn't say anything, but he was being shoved into the crate. He looked up at Charlotte and gave her a wink. She knew he was saying goodbye in the only way he could, and she knew her children were safe. Goodbye, she whispered. Then she summoned all her strength and waved one of her front legs at him. She never moved again. Next day, as the Ferris wheel was being taken apart, the racehorses were being loaded into the van, and the entertainers were packing up their belongings and driving away in their trailers, Charlotte died. The fairgrounds were soon deserted. The sheds and buildings were empty and forlorn. The infield was littered with bottles and trash. Nobody of the hundreds of people that had visited the fair knew that a gray spider had played the most important part of all. No one was with her when she died. Chapter 22. A Warm Wind And so Wilbur came home to his beloved manure pile in the barn cellar. He was a he, his was a strange homecoming. Around his neck, he wore a medal of honor. In his mouth, he held a sack of spider eggs. There's no place like home, Wilbur thought, as he placed Charlotte's 514 unborn children carefully in a safe corner. The barn smelled good. His friends, the sheep and the geese, were glad to see him back. The geese gave him a noisy welcome. Congrat, congrat, congratulations, they cried. Nice work. Mr. Zuckerman took the medal from Wilbur's neck and hung it on a nail over the pig pen, where visitors could examine it. Wilbur himself could look at it whenever he wanted to. In the days that followed, he was very happy. He grew to a great size. He no longer worried about being killed, for he knew that Mr. Zuckerman would keep him as long as he lived. Wilbur often thought of Charlotte. A few strands of her old web still hung in the doorway. Every day, Wilbur would stand and look at the torn, empty web, and a lump would come to his throat. No one had ever had such a friend, so affectionate, so loyal, and so skillful. The autumn days grew shorter. Lurvy brought the squash, squashes and pumpkins in from the garden, piled them on the barn floor, where they wouldn't get nipped by frosty nights. The maples and birches turned bright colors, and the winds shook them, and they dropped their leaves one by one to the ground. Under the wild apple trees in the pasture, the red little apples lay thick on the ground, and the sheep gnawed them, and the geese gnawed them, and the foxes came in the night and sniffed them. One evening, just before Christmas, snow began falling. It covered house and barn and fields and woods. Wilbur had never seen snow before. When morning came, he went out and plowed the drifts in his yard for the fun of it. Fern and Avery arrived, dragging a sled. They coasted down the lane and out into the frozen pond in the pasture. Coasting is the most fun there is, said Avery. The most fun there is, retorted Fern, is when the Ferris wheel stops and Henry and I are at the top car and Henry makes the car swing and we can see everything for miles and miles and miles. Goodness, are you still thinking about that old Ferris wheel? said Avery in disgust. The fair was weeks and weeks ago. I think about it all the time, said Fern, picking snow from her ear. After Christmas, the thermometer dropped to ten below zero. Cold settled on the world. The pasture was bleak and frozen. 
The cows stayed in the barn all the time now, except on sunny mornings when they went out and stood in the barnyard in the lee of the straw pile. The sheep stayed near the barn, too, for protection. When they were thirsty, they ate snow. The geese hung around the barnyard the way boys hang around a drugstore, and Mr. Zuckerman fed them corn and turnips to keep them cheerful. Many, many, many thanks, they always said when they saw food coming. Templeton moved indoors when winter came. His ratty home under the pig trough was too chilly, so he fixed himself a cozy nest in the barn behind the grain bins. He lined it with bits of dirty newspaper and rags, and whenever he found a trinket or a keepsake, he carried it home and stored it there. He continued to visit Wilbur three times a day, exactly at mealtime, and Wilbur kept the promise he had made. Wilbur let the rat eat first. Then, when Templeton couldn't hold another mouthful, Wilbur would eat. As a result of overeating, Templeton grew bigger and fatter than any rat you ever saw. He was gigantic. He was as big as a young woodchuck. The old sheep spoke to him about his size one day. You would live longer, said the old sheep, if you ate less. Who wants to live forever, sneered the rat. I'm naturally a heavy eater, and I get untold satisfaction from the pleasure of the feast. His, he patted his stomach, grinned at the sheep, and crept upstairs to lie down. All winter, Wilbur watched over Charlotte's egg sack as though he were guarding his own children. He had scooped out a special place in the manure for the sack next to the board fence. On very cold nights, he lay so that his breath would warm it. For Wilbur, nothing in life was so important as this small, round object. Nothing else mattered. Patiently, he awaited the end of winter and the coming of the little spiders. Life is always a rich and steady time when you're waiting for something to happen or to hatch. The winter ended at last. I heard the frogs today, said the old sheep one evening. Listen, you can hear them now. Wilbur stood still and cocked his ears. From the pond, in shrill chorus, came the voices of hundreds of little frogs. Springtime, said the old sheep thoughtfully. Another spring. As she walked away, Wilbur saw a new lamb following her. It was only a few hours old. The snows melted and ran away. The streams and ditches bubbled and chattered with rushing water. A sparrow with a streaky breast arrived and sang. The light strengthened. The mornings came sooner. Almost every morning there was another new lamb in the sheepfold. The goose was sitting on nine eggs. The sky seemed whiter and a warm wind blew. The last remains of Charlotte's web floated away and vanished. One fine sunny morning after breakfast, Wilbur stood watching his precious sack. He wasn't thinking of anything much. As he stood there, he noticed something move. He stepped closer and stared. A tiny spider crawled from the sack. It's no bigger than a grain of sand, no bigger than the head of a pin. Its body was gray with a black stripe underneath. Its legs were gray and tan. It looked just like Charlotte. Wilbur trembled all over when he saw it. The little spider waved at him. Then Wilbur looked more closely. Two more little spiders crawled out and waved. They climbed round and round on the sack, exploring their new world. Then three little, more little spiders. Then eight. Then ten. Charlotte's children were here at last. Wilbur's heart pounded. He began to squeal. Then he raced in circles, kicking manure into the air. Then he turned a backflip. Then he planted his front feet and came to a stop in front of Charlotte's children. Hello there, he said. The first spider said, hello, but its voice was so small, Wilbur couldn't hear it. I am an old friend of your mother, said Wilbur. I'm glad to see you. Are you all right? Is everything all right? The little spiders waved their forelegs at him. Wilbur could see by the way they acted that they were glad to see him. Is there anything I can get you? Is there anything you need? The young spiders just waved. For several days and several nights, they crawled here and there, up and down, around and about, waving at Wilbur, trailing tiny drag lines behind them and exploring their home. There were dozens and dozens of them. Wilbur couldn't count them, but he knew that he had a great many new friends. They grew quite rapidly. Soon, each was as big as a BB shot. 
They made tiny webs near the sack. Then came a quiet morning when Mr. Zuckerman opened the door on the north side. A warm draft of rising air blew softly through the cellar, barn cellar. The air smelled of the damp earth, of the spruce wood, and of the sweet springtime. The baby spiders felt the warm updraft. One spider climbed to the top of the fence. Then it did something that came as a great surprise to Wilbur. The spider stood on its head, pointed its spinneret in the air, and let loose a cloud of fine silk. The silk formed a balloon. As Wilbur watched, the spider let go of the fence and rose into the air. Goodbye, it said as it sailed through the doorway. Wait a minute, screamed Wilbur. Where do you think you're going? But the spider was already out of sight. Then another baby spider crawled to the top of the fence, stood on its head, made a balloon, and sailed away. Then another spider, then another. The air was soon filled with tiny balloons, each balloon carrying a spider. Wilbur was frantic. Charlotte's babies were disappearing at a great rate. Come back, children, he cried. Goodbye, he called. Goodbye, goodbye. At last, one little spider took time enough to stop and talk to Wilbur before making its balloon. We're leaving here on the warm updraft. This is our moment for setting forth. We are aeronauts, and we are going out into the world to make webs for ourselves. But where, asked Wilbur, wherever the wind takes us, high, low, near, far, east, west, north, south, we take to the breeze. We go as we please. Are all of you going, asked Wilbur. You can't all go. I would be left alone with no friends. Your mother wouldn't want that to happen, I'm sure. The air was now so full of balloonists that the barn cellar looked almost as though a mist had gathered. Balloons by the dozen were rising, circling, and drifting away through the door, sailing off on the gentle wind. Cries of, goodbye, 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 came weakly to Wilbur's ear. He couldn't bear to watch any more. In sorrow, he sank to the ground and closed his eyes. This seems like the end of the world to be deserted by Charlotte's children. Wilbur cried himself to sleep. When he woke, it was late afternoon. He looked at the egg sack. It was empty. He looked into the air. The balloonists were gone. Then he walked drearily to the doorway where Charlotte's web used to be. He was standing there thinking of her when he heard a small voice. Salutations, it said. I'm up here. So am I said another tiny voice. So am I, said the third voice. Three of us are staying. We like this place, and we like you. Wilbur looked up. At the top of the doorway, three small webs were being constructed. On each web, working busily, was one of Charlotte's daughters. Can I take this to mean, asked Wilbur, that you have definitely decided to live here in the barn cellar, and that I'm going to have three friends? You can indeed, said the spiders. What are your names, please, asked Wilbur, trembling with joy. I'll tell you my name, replied the first little spider, if you'll tell me why you are trembling. I'm trembling with joy, said Wilbur. Then my name is Joy, said the first spider. What was my mother's middle initial, asked the second spider. A, said Wilbur. Then my name is Aranea, said the spider. How about me, asked the third spider. Will you just pick out a nice, sensible name for me? Something not too long, not too fancy, not too dumb. Wilbur thought hard. Nelly, he suggested. Fine, I like that very much, said the third spider. You may call me Nelly. She daintily fastened her orb line to the next spoke of the web. Wilbur's heart brimmed with happiness. He felt that he should make a short speech on this very important occasion. Joy, Aranea Nelly, he began. Welcome to the barn cellar. You have chosen a hallowed doorway from which to string your webs. I think it is only fair to tell you that I have devote I was devoted to your mother. I owe my very life to her. She was brilliant, beautiful, and loyal to the end. I shall always treasure her memory. To you, her daughters, I pledge my friendship forever and ever. I pledge mine, said Joy. I do too, said 
Arania. I do too, said Nellie, who had just managed to catch a small gnat. It was a happy day for Wilbur, and many more happy, tranquil days followed. As time went on and the months and years came and went, he was never without friends. Fern did not come regularly to the barn anymore. She was growing up and was careful to avoid childish things, like sitting in a milk stool near a pig pen. But Charlotte's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, year after year, lived in the doorway. Each spring, there were new little spiders hatching out to take the place of the old. Most of them sailed away on their balloons, but always two or three stayed and set up housekeeping in the doorway. Mr. Zuckerman took fine care of Wilbur all the rest of his days, and the pig was often visited by friends and admirers, for nobody ever forgot the year of his triumph and the miracle of the web. Life in the barn was very good, night and day, winter and summer, spring and fall, dull days and bright days. It was the best place to be, thought Wilbur, this warm, delicious cellar with its garrulous geese, garrulous geese and changing seasons, the heat of the sun, the passage of swallows, the nearness of rats, the sameness of sheep, the love of spiders, the smell of manure, and the glory of everything. Wilbur never forgot Charlotte, although he loved her children and grandchildren dearly. None of the new spiders ever quite took her place in his heart. She was in a class by herself. It was not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. Charlotte was both. The End Charlotte's Web